So the visual system is uh, controlled by what we want to do in the environment. So our visual uh, visual input is determined by a certain angle that's determined by your eyes, so where you're looking. Whereas your ears are sensitive to information all around you. Above you, below you, in the dark, in sort of crowded environments. Um, you receive information through the ears even when you're highly focused on, on other things. And uh, even when you're sleeping. So we, don't, we can't close our, our ears, despite the fact that we do close our eyes and, and we can kind of remove our, our, our sense of touch. And um, this observation has resulted in a, in a hypothesis that the auditory system that we have you know, quite a lot of evidence for, but that's the hypothesis that I want to promote today, that the auditory system has evolved as the brain's early warning system. So as a system that continually, irrespective of what you're doing, scanning the environment for potentially important events that it then brings to your attention. And we all have this intuitive feeling of first hearing something important and then turning to look at it. Um, some more clues for this function of the auditory system can be seen just from its structure. So this is a very simplified cartoon of, 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 the, of the auditory system. This is cortex, so this is sort of the new, uh, the new brain, so the relatively recently evolved structures. And these are all um, subcortical brainstem structures. And as you can appreciate from this cartoon, much of, uh, of the processing within the auditory system actually happens in these early, um, early uh, processing stages. And this is unlike the visual pathway, for example, where, where there's one synapse, so one stop from, from the eye to and uh, this is a slightly more detailed uh, description of the same thing. So this is cortex up here, and this is all of these processing stages that happen subcortically. And this is also a simplified uh, you know, chart. But the point of this is to show that a lot of this processing happens early. It's possible that uh, the, a reason for this is the temporal processing demands for sounds. So in order to be able to track and understand sounds, we have to be able to process things very, very rapidly. Um, another reason is that the system has to interact with the instinctive, automatic processing in the brain, with a lot of it being implemented in the brain. So, um, this is an example for, for um, what, one such use of the auditory system. Um, this, is a, this is a movie that was shot in the Mojave Desert in America. Unfortunately, uh, there's no sound. Um, in, this, in this movie, but you can imagine, so this is the desert at night, it's not quiet, it's very loud, there's weather sounds and there's various insect sounds. And um, there's the two heroes of this movie are over here, so there's the rattlesnake and the kangaroo rat. Um, the movie is, so it's pitch dark, uh, the, the movie is shot with infrared cameras. And uh, our two heroes are um, about to uh, meet and their meeting is going to play out like this. And I've stopped it to mention a few more things. One is that uh, the rattlesnake is deaf, uh, or, or at least doesn't have very good hearing. Um, he uses vibration and has very, very good vision. And so the rattlesnake is able to uh, detect its prey based on these cues and home into its prey very rapidly. The rat, on the other hand, has an amazing auditory system. Despite the fact that it's far foraging for food in the desert now, despite the fact that there's all of these sounds here, he's able to use his auditory system to detect the sound of the snake preparing to uh, launch its attack and execute this amazing escape that's probably labeled it as the luckiest rat on the planet. <laughs> and the point is that all as humans, uh, you know, it was hard to find an equally dramatic example for, for what the auditory system is useful for. But in fact, I mean, we, we use it for similar uh, purposes all the time, even in the current environments in which we live. So the cyclist is hopefully focusing on the road. The only information that he has in order to understand that a bus is coming, that he has to react in a certain way, is um, through his ears. This is why it's really unfortunate that many cyclists wear headphones when they cycle. And, uh, and this, uh, this, this subcortical processing, this really fast automatic processing of the auditory system enables him to do this because a lot of these cues 
result in very rapid reactions of the body. So when um, commonly referred to instinct as a sort of fight or flight response, it's this response of the body to a, um, an unexpected, surprising, or behaviorally relevant stimulus that, uh, that is associated with uh, increased heart rate, with a, um, a change in muscle tone, uh, with a, a change in respiration, and so on. That, that is, all of these are meant to sort of prepare the body for action, action. And this is what the rat is doing. So if you notice in the movie, the rat kind of froze, and then kind of jumped away. And uh, these, uh, these are risks. It's, it's known that the auditory system activates this, this uh, flight or fright response really rapidly, more rapidly than any of the other senses. Well, but um, I will zoom out of this uh, uh, automatic brainstem system and back into the brain of the cyclist, who is, um, uh, like I said, focusing on the road, and whose auditory system, to enable him to survive in this example, is hypothesized to be sort of continually uh, tracking the state of the scene. So that if something important happens, if there's a change, a salient change in the environment, like a bus appearing or somebody yelling to him, um, he can react. And it's these sorts of questions about um, the auditory system's automatic scanning of the environment that we're particularly interested uh, in my lab. And the kind of questions that we ask is, is what information does the brain track? So the auditory brain. Uh, what brain systems are involved? Uh, what determines um, the fact that certain sounds uh, capture your attention? So I just said most of this happens beyond your control and, and subconsciously, pretty attentively. But occasionally we do become aware of, of, of things around us. And so what determines this this access to us? And the approach that uh, that we take in lab. I mean, I, I showed you the. I mean, the, the general approach is, is to design uh, stimuli that we believe mirror what the auditory system uh, would be doing in the natural scene, but strip them to the bare minimum in terms of their complexity so that we can very specifically, very tightly control various aspects of the sound um, and measure performance. And then once we've identified uh, you know, that kind of stimulus, then we extract brain and behavior um, and, and so for the rest of the talk, I'll show you a few examples of these kinds of assays. Um, the first stimulus that I'll talk about might be familiar to some of you is possibly the most uh, commonly used stimulus in my field. And uh, it's always sort of a little bit embarrassing to describe it because it is very, very simple. Um, the cartoon, a cartoon is shown here, so this is time and this is frequency, and each square denotes a pure tone. And they alternate here in this kind of endless succession. We have low tone, high tone, low tone, high tone, and so on. And it sounds like that. So the reason uh, this stimulus is interesting is because we can make very, very few changes in the stimulus that will result in quite a dramatic change in how you perceive it. So this one, uh, you probably heard it as a sequence of A and B tones, just an alternating sequence, right? And that's because the stimuli, the, these, the frequencies of the two tones are close enough together to make it kind of likely statistically that they, that they uh, uh, might be uh, emanating from the same source. And so you hear it just as a sequence of A, B, A, B tones. But if I separate them in frequency, so I make the, the um, the B tone higher in frequency. And then the perceptor becomes very, and I don't change the rate, so nothing else has changed. The person becomes dramatically different. Now you hear them as two separate streams. So it sounds like that. So you get it. Should I make it louder or is the loudness okay? Um, the interesting uh, phenomenon that I want to focus on is what happens. When, and so, and I, the reason you hear those two separate streams is possibly because uh, the brain has evolved uh, to sort of understand that the statistics of the environment are such that it's unlikely that natural sources, a single natural source, can emit uh, sounds that are in, in, that sounds that are so um, different in frequency so quickly, and hence it's more likely to interpret. It's more likely that the stimulus reflects two uh, separate streams and not one bound stream. 
and the, the, this explanation that I offered is one of the auditory system sort of reasoning or sort of making some sort of decision about how to interpret this stimulus. And this is an important one because, of course, all of our sensory information all the time is incomplete and noisy and um, sometimes uh, you have some contradiction between the senses and it's, it is an active task of the brain to try to understand from this input what is actually happening in the environment. And so here, this is a simple example of that happening. So in one case, the brain decided that this might be one stream and need to interpret it as such. And it, sorry. And in another case, it might have decided that these are two streams and, it, uh, and you perceive them as such. But to, to, to really understand or tap the system more precisely, we can place the B tone in a kind of intermediate range, where it's sort of likely, statistically, that, that it could be a single source. It's also possible that there are two separate sources. And what happens when you listen to this device now is that your perception flips between the two interpretations in, in an entirely automatic and um, uh, uh, uncontrollable way, in the sense that even if you try very hard to perceive it in one way, so they're integrated or segregated, it's unlikely that you'll succeed. So I'll play uh, this example now. It's going to run for longer than the other ones. Um, and I want you to introspect about it, see whether you can hear it. So you'll likely hear it as, as integrated in the first instance. You'll hear it going A, B, A, A, B, A, A, B. And then at some point, it might separate into two streams. And then it might come back again. It would be better for the close one eyes. You could. Um, actually, there, there's some argument about whether that helps. But, um, but yeah, try it. You could close your eyes.
I was lucky for you. Did it uh, when we had a longer time of studying together in the time? Not quite. Close enough. But you're in good company in the sense that their subjects couldn't do it either. So when their subjects got to listen to it for an hour and um, still couldn't do it, couldn't tell what the rule was. But um, the way they ran this experiment is they, is they wired them to... Uh, so the rule, by the way, is short followed by low, long followed by high. Um, they wired their subjects uh, their, into an EEG system, so they were recording their brain activity. Occasionally they were introducing notes that would, after a while, after they established this rule, they would introduce notes that would violate the pattern, and uh, these notes evoked a, a prototypical brain response that's related to detecting a mismatch. And then they concluded from the study that their listeners' brains could detect the rule, even though consciously we can't. So uh, colloquially, uh, the conclusion was that your brain is smarter than you. But, uh, but my question is, why should your brain care? I mean, so this, this, uh, uh, this rule is clearly nothing uh, like what we use sound for in the real world. It's not important to anything from an evolutionary perspective. None of these sounds we had encountered in the forest or the jungle or whatever. So why would your brain use, presumably, we use quite a lot of energy just to detect this pattern. You have to remember you. The brain has to remember things and then and uh, um, check for consistency and scan and so on. Why would your brain spend energy on learning this? Yeah? Let's say you pick new information out of the background chatter. Exactly. The answer is because that's what it does. And this is a sort of an extreme example of this, but the, the brain continually um, is seeking predictability within sensory input um, because this is what it's wired to do, quite fundamentally. If you think about it from a philosophical perspective, if we're a black box, we have our senses to tell us what's happening outside. The only way to know that you know something is if you can predict what's going to come next. And this is also the only way to learn because you can predict and then you can compare your prediction with what actually happened and if it, the prediction matches then you know that you know. If the prediction doesn't match, you change something within your model and you try again. And this, this model uh, kind of broadly called predictive coding is currently a popular model with which to understand perception broadly and auditory perception in particular. And it makes sense if you think about it, a lot of information, a lot of sources that we are interested in in the environment are predictable in nature. So most sounds generated by living beings are predictable just because our bodies are predictable. We're limited by various physical rules of limit how we can move and how we speak and so a lot of, uh, how we speak in, in different levels. So the pitch of my voice is predictable, the context is predictable, so I'm not, you know, I'm not speaking randomly. You can predict with relatively high precision the next word that I'm going to say. On a smaller scale, you can predict uh, the, uh, the, the prosody of my voice predict when I will say certain things based on the rhythm of English and of my, and my accent that you would have sort of got, gotten used to in the last 20 minutes. Um, and so this, uh, this understanding, I mean this is what I mean when I say that hearing and listening is an active process. It's something that is constantly trying to interpret uh, what it assumes is noisy and incomplete information. And, um, and like I said, it makes sense because many sounds that we want to understand are predictable. And so partly uh, the, the task of, of discovering patterns is associated with perception, is associated with recognizing what is out there. So a simple example is if I play this kind of sound, you might you know, not really know what it is. But if I play a series of these, you immediately know what it is. And you can also tell a lot more about just beyond what it is about what's happening. You know, where somebody is walking how quickly, uh, the various properties of the surface, some properties of their body. Um, and so we use this sensitivity to patterns that we probably um, discover through this uh, iterative loop of prediction um, to help us listen. So we can efficiently process expected events. So back to this footstep example, uh, because when you listen to it, you start predicting when the next one's going to happen. You can, um, I can, for example, move out of the way when I feel that it's going to like, come close to me. Uh, or I can rapidly detect um, a change. So if I listen to the footsteps 
I start predicting when the next one's going to come when it doesn't. So for example, if the next one comes earlier or later than when I predicted, then I know immediately that something changed and that I should react you know, in certain situations. So it's these sorts of events that um, it's this sort of processing that patterns are, are useful for. And um, I was going to add, end, and I have five minutes, I guess, so that's okay, um, to show you another example uh, of this remarkable um, sensitivity of our auditory system um, to patterns. And this is based on listening to random uh, tone dip uh, sequences that are um, illustrated here. So this is a spectrogram again, this is time, and this is frequency, and uh, each square here is a 50 millisecond tone, so they're very rapid. And uh, they vary in frequency. And it sounds, I'm going to make it softer because it was loud last time. It sounds like that. It's just a mix, so a random sequence of tones. But when you're listening to this, your brain is continually trying to make sense of this sound. And one way in which we can understand this is by, um, unbeknown to you, of introducing some structure in the signal. So one simple way in which we could do it is we could start it off random and then at some point uh, change it into a regular pattern. So you can see here that, it, uh, that from this point onwards there is a 10 tone pattern that's repeating. You can see it visually, and kind of. And this is what it sounds like. <laughs> It's very uh, obvious, right? I mean, you, you didn't have to introspect. It's too rapid to introspect, but you just heard it about. But if you think about the computations that, have, that, that had to happen in your brain for that to happen, it's quite remarkable because um, your brain doesn't know that it was going to happen here. Um, you, you, you don't know what the pattern is going to be, so you have to maintain some kind of memory of this ongoing random stimulus compare each time uh, an incoming tone to the sort of representation and then decide when, when, uh, when it started repeating. And of course, visually, I've, uh, you, you, you have all of the signal at your sort of disposal now, but your auditory system just hears you know, one tone at a time. So you have to maintain all of this in memory. So, so how quickly can, can you do this? So obviously, you can't do it during the first cycle, because the first cycle is just a random sequence of tones. So you need, you need to wait longer, so you need to wait for it to start repeating to figure out that it's repeating. Um, but so how, how, um, how much more do you need? Um, we have a, an ideal observer model. So it's a computational model that, is, uh, that has infinite memory, um, infinite computational capacity. It can remember all the possible, kind of, it can remember the sequence. And uh, the model suggested that uh, the best you can do, statistically speaking, is uh, this first cycle and four tones. So you don't even have to hear it repeating twice. It's enough to hear the first four tones repeating for the ideal observer to conclude that, uh, that the sequence is repeating. How, so how, how long do humans need? I'll, I'll play a few more examples so you can, sort of, you can introspect. So it's a new pattern each time. How long do you think you need it? Silence. Um, so what you probably need is um, what our listeners in the lab needed is exactly the same information as an ideal observer. So they were for so this um, really computationally complex pattern they did these like computers. And this is remarkable, again, because these sounds are nothing like what we encounter in the real world. But the fact that we are so, so efficient with them suggests that this taps these uh, systems that, that, that automatically, continuously makes, uh, try to make sense of them. That's what we do all the time. And it's, it's sort of a very uh, optimistic view of the auditory system in a sense, well, of the sensory system in a sense that even though it's presented with, with you know, the randomness, it's still continually seeks regularity. Um, this is just to say that we can do the same, so this experiment involved you and participants in the lab act actively uh, making a decision about the pattern. We can do the same thing um, with a, 
by distracting them. So in this experiment, we measure their brain activity, but they're performing some kind of visual task. They're told that the sounds are irrelevant, um, and they're just there to make the visual task harder. It's a hard visual task that involves memory. Um, we can record their brain responses to these patterns, and we see the same thing. So we see, I mean, I'm not going to go into detail of what these uh, things uh, represent because we don't have much time, but we basically see their brain responding. So this is the response to this emergence of the pattern um, as quickly as an ideal observer, as quickly as when they were actively <coughs> um, And just to conclude, uh, to say that it's probably the case that um, this um, instinctive basic mechanism is probably um, underlying um, a lot of higher level functions like our enjoyment of music, for example. So music uh, or enjoyment of music involves this balance between detecting patterns and violations of patterns and uh, transgression of patterns. And, uh, and we know that for music to be enjoyable, this, that it's a very, very um, specific balance that has to be maintained between uh, uh, confirming your predictions and, and surprising you. And it's likely that, that uh, at least some of this processing um, is dependent on these mechanisms, on these very, very simple mechanisms that we are studying in the context of auditory semen analysis.